Greetings everyone, Christian Barker here and this is the latest instalment of Banter with Barker, my ongoing series of interviews during the COVID-19 lockdown and or circuit breaker period. And today uh, it's my great pleasure to be speaking with an old friend of mine, name of Josol Tiefenbrunn, a fantastic tailor and rabbi based out of New York City, who's been getting a lot of attention um, lately for his bespoke masks, um, which have been written up kind of all across the across the press. Um, a, a new line that Josol pivoted to during uh, this period, which has been tough to carry on the traditional tailoring tailoring trade that is his stock in trade. Um, Yosa will be joining us in just a moment. I first met him um, quite a number of years ago, I guess now, um, when he was out here in Singapore, uh, kind of uh, working across across two fields, um, getting his his final bona fides as a uh, as a Jewish rabbi, and um, and also working with uh, with my friend and his uh, Kevin Sear, one of the leading tailors out here in uh, in Southeast Asia. Yosel has also um, apprenticed, I believe, at uh, Maurice Sedwell on uh, on Savile Row, highly respected uh, British tailor, and uh, and yeah, the last kind of four or five years, I believe it is, he's been uh, he's been working in New York City uh, out of his own his own shop. I'm just gonna send him an invite here. Have him with us in a moment. If anyone has any uh, any questions they'd like to ask about um, tailoring related matters, sartorial matters, or uh, the ins and outs of uh, a good face mask, which many of us are having to having to work with at the moment when we venture outdoors, um, please do just send your uh, your questions on through, and we'll. Uh, We'll get those. Uh, we'll get those answered ASAP. Okay, we have Yosel with us now. Yosel just hit that button. There we go. Here he is, joining us, the man himself. Nine p.m. New York time. 9.03 a.m. here in Singapore. Greece, sir, how are you? I'm very well, thank God. How are you? It's not too bad. Not too bad. It's good to be speaking with you. And, and, and you know, speaking of being very well, I, I only realized uh, doing a bit more uh, reading up of your recent press that, that you, you actually suffered with the, with the COVID-19, had a, had a case of the, uh, of the logi there how how did you uh, how, how how did you find that how how was that was it a pretty terrifying experience it it was indeed my 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 children first got it um wow. and uh they had it for a few days um one had it for the older one had it a little bit rougher than the younger one um and she had she actually had rashes she had um like body aches and uh, and then the regular virus stuff, and then my the younger one, which is which is one and a half years old, he had had it like a regular uh, virus, like fever, um, yeah. coughing, um, and then my wife got it, and she had it for two days. So we it's all got it, but in stages. Yeah, yeah. So so we were able to both take care of the kids. Then then my wife got it. Then I got it. So I was able to to help out. And then um, it was the other way around. Um, she had it for two days, then no taste and smell for another week. Yeah, and wow. then I had, it, I had it for five days and no taste and no smell for like three weeks following that. Thank you. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> that, that's probably the, the least of it. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, uh, that you threw this and, uh, and, and all back in... Uh, uh, fine fessel once again. But but seeing seeing you know I was in a, I was living in I'm living in Crown Heights, which is a community within Brooklyn, hmm. and you know we had Jewish holiday of Purim, which was right around that time before before any guidance or lockdowns were official. 
So the holiday is kind of everybody gets together, gives out baskets to people, goes to people's houses, drink a lot, you know, sharing glasses even. It's, it's one of those holidays. And unfortunately, everybody, pretty much the whole community got it. Um, when I say I got it for five days, I'm lucky because there, there are many that, um, that went to the hospital, some that didn't make it, some that made it after three, four weeks being on ventilators. So, you know, I got it for five days, but thank God I was breathing fine. Um, I just had the, the chills, the body aches. My back felt like um, I thought I had a problem with my, with my back or the bed. Um, but it was, I only realized after that it was to do with the, the virus. I didn't really know all the, the symptoms before. Um, yeah. I, but I yeah. Think- you know, discounting that, you know, okay, well, it, it is mostly, uh, very sadly, the, the elderly and, and otherwise, um, you know, people with secondary uh, illnesses or ailments that are uh, sadly passing from this thing. But, you know, guys of uh, young whippersnappers such as ourselves, um, I think you're a little bit younger than I am, but, uh, but no, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it can have a harsh effect and even have facial effects on, on people of, of our age as well. So, no, absolutely. Um, look, glad, glad you, you, you made it through, and, I, and I, um, we'll, we'll move on from, from yep. such depressing matters. But, but I guess, you know, moving on from that, um, you have uh, been, been getting a huge amount of uh, perhaps unexpected attention for, uh, for these uh, initiatives that you've been doing whilst this crisis has been going on and has been kind of preventing you from uh, practicing your regular um, trade as a, as a tailor, or your art as a tailor, I should say, um, in making the masks. And, and, you know, New York Post with its, with its all kind, of, kind of very, uh, you know, $300 hipster masks for, for exactly. some yeah. Yeah. Um, sensationalist uh, story. But, you know, great coverage for you. Has, has it been surprising getting all of that, uh, that media attention for what you're doing now as a secondary thing during this situation? It was very unexpected and um, very surprising. The whole entire thing was very surprising. I mean, you know, I went from having the virus to being in lockdown with, the, with, the, with my kids, with the family, in, the, in, you know, in our apartment, mm-hmm. you know, two bedroom apartment here in Brooklyn. Um, then to, you know, saying like, you know, I had my antibodies um, I, I was positive for my antibodies. So that was, I guess, as of what we know now, the likelihood of getting it again is, is, is slim or at mm. least for now. Um, so I figured, you know, I could either go two months plus without um, any income coming in. I was still, I was still paying my tailors because um, luckily our, our business was growing and growing. And up until that point, obviously, um, and we still had plenty of work to, to be done. And yeah. they, they were able to take home before um, the virus started a lot of work. So my trouser maker um, took home plenty of trousers. And um, I cut the hours a little bit um, on, on, on all of them. Um, but just to be able to, to, to you know, manage. But at least we were able to um, pay them at least most of their, their wages throughout. But it came to a certain point where... I had to decide, um, you know, I couldn't do it any longer. You know, I'm paying rent, paying all the bills. Mm-hmm. Um, we're either going to go down or I have to come up with something. Yeah. Um, so I went back to work alone and I started working on some samples and seeing, you know, um, what's out there. And the, the, the issue that I was having, being that I have glasses and, and a long beard that kind of seemed to... Can't yeah. seem to yeah capture it in the video, but um, uh, I was having issues with the fogging up of the glasses. Um, you know, going in and out of the car, uh, even walking down the street, mm-hmm. and obviously trying to work potentially working with a mask and having it fog up. You couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the beard, the pushing back of the beard all the way, because naturally the masks have this chin part yep. that kind of you know hugs underneath the chin. So those two issues for me um, were an issue, you know, were, were a major issue um, for me to continue wearing a mask. So I try to see if I could, you know, come up with something for myself, you know, to, to manage that. 
And then I, you know, I was working on the pattern, recutting it, re-editing it, re, and um, we, you know, I came up with with something with a with a pattern. And then I kind of started, you know, I, I made a bunch of them because you can't, you know, you can't have people trying on the same mask. That's the that's the issue as well, right? Oh, so yeah. every, every time you make a sample, you got to you got to make ten of them, yeah. and you're going to go out back to your community, back to back to the thing, and give give them out. And then you can't get them back after, right? So you, so you, <laughs> so every sample, I found myself making 10, 15 of them and, and um, giving out free, you know, giving out the masks. And, um, and then we finally came to a, a point that we, we were happy with the, with the, with the pattern. And then I made it, so I made it for the beard. I made it for, um, for men without beards. And, and then I had like a, uh, a smaller size, so I have a I have a medium, a large, and a beard model, and I added later on an extra large. So the medium is is mostly, I mean, most like females, most women would fit into the into that medium size, or even mm -hmm. some men, and yeah. and then the large is generally for for men, and then the extra large would be for someone that has a a, a larger face, uh, the distance between the nose and the and the chin, or the mm -hmm. distance between the nose and the ear. Um, so we came up with those all those patterns, and then uh, I started selling it on social media, yeah, um, pre pre ordering it because I didn't make I didn't make a hundred of each pattern because now we've got medium, large, you know. So then the orders came in from Twitter, from LinkedIn, from from Instagram, and then we had to I had to call back my workers, um, you know, I had to call back my workers to the shop and. Um, and you know, some felt comfortable, some didn't. So uh, coming back, so that's how we went, started off like that, and um, and then we went full force, and uh, then we eventually put it. We had like 150 pre-orders of these masks that we had to kind of make, and they they take time. They're not, you know, oh. the, the the whole the whole um, the the pattern, the way we created it for the for the anti fog, was that we had this like 18 gauge. Uh, wire, which actually I had to go through like you know, 20 different style wires and and pieces inside, and and you know some didn't have that kind of strength to hold it down on your nose, and uh, some would crack, and some just it was going through you know, and I had to make all these samples, and then and then add change the wire, and then try it all yeah. again. Um, but then we we got there, and then we put it on the website, and then I was giving the mask, I was selling the, I sold the mask to someone, and I dropped it off. And he, you know, connected me with a journalist. He called up the journalist in front of me uh, for the New York Post. And, oh. um, and that was that. And we had, and of course, I naturally said that, um, you know, I'm doing, which I did, I did for, for a few customers, um, bespoke masks, um, which I would charge quite a lot more. I would do a, a fitting, or create a pattern um, for their, you know, based on pictures or based on a Skype or a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And, um, I would create a pattern, send them the fitting, then connect again on a Zoom, and then and then um, based off that, create the masks for them. So you're making kind of a, a dummy mask as a as a first uh, a fitting mask in the same way you'd make a, a fitting shirt or a fitting pair of shoes or whatever. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So naturally, so na so naturally, is when when she, so I said masks could go up to three, four, five hundred dollars. I mean. If, if I were to use a you know, super 200s, uh, you know, thread count fabric, I mean, you know, who knows how much you could spend. They jumped on that, obviously, and, and put that as the, as the headline. And that was, was, was clickbait. And that, that kind of, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, you know, the, the, the headline was the headline. You know, natural, again, naturally, I have a beard, so I'm considered a hipster. And then... Um, uh, so that went viral, and then Daily Mail picked it up, and uh, I was on the Daily Mail slap, Snapchat, and and that was fun. But it was it, it brought brought in a lot of sales, which was great because I was able to continue the business. Um, we also gave ten percent of our of our profits to to um, different local charities um, fighting COVID. Well, uh, some of the uh, frontliners, nurses, we donated some meals, um, quite a few days that we donated uh, lunches and dinners and like drinks and snacks to different floors in the hospitals, um, which we all felt kind of good giving, being able to, being able to, to, you know, creating something 
and then being able to give from it as well, which was, which was, which was cool. Um, and the team was able to transition very well. And then the team kind of kept on coming back. And then we ended up being fully back. And um, yeah, we've been doing math since, but obviously once we, once the guidelines came out that were allowed to open officially, mm-hmm. and then we kind of transitioned back into tailoring. That's great. Well, you're back to work, but uh, but no, look, you know, from from telling that full story, and I think this is this is the really I, I always say this is the important thing with with anything that's that's craftsmanship based or, or focused or originated is that if you do go into that story as you just have and, and talking about you know all of those prototypes that you had to make the fact that that you know particularly you know for these bespoke um, iterations you've got to go through the process of, of making a, a dummy mask or perhaps two of them, um, you know, go through a really tricky process of, of fitting and, and research and development for the, the regular line, um, then, you know, it, it helps people understand. Uh, you know, someone just there, um, Jason Marshall was just commenting, geez, you know, $500 for a, uh, for a mask. But as you say, I, I can see how, uh, and, and, you know, the materials aren't cheap either. So... Um, yeah, it certainly makes sense. But we've had a lot of comments the last couple of minutes with uh, with people giving their personal um, endorsement to the product who've obviously customers of yours. So uh, no I just want, to, just want to make clear that the, the masks do go for $50. That's a detail yeah. that, that sometimes is hidden at the bottom of the article. So they go for $45, $50. It's only like, you know, if you really felt like you needed a bespoke mask, then, then obviously, yeah. Yeah, which, which, you know, some of us just demand Vicuña. Uh, nothing but Vicuña touches the skin, right? So, exactly. Well, uh, I just uh, made a tweed one. I just made a tweed one to match someone's uh, sports car, which was, which was, which it kind of, it, 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 it was, I mean, it was a, probably the most beautiful mask out of all the masks I've made because of the way it naturally sat. It's a 460 grams, um, you know, tweed. So it has, it has its body. It has its structure to it so it it was it was gorgeous and it sat on him really well yeah that sounds like it'd be it'd be quite warm on the face you wouldn't want to be yes bearded. yes uh, he'll, he'll, he'll probably be wearing it in, in you know indoors his, his well he commissioned the, the sports coat probably in slightly in the wrong season but now with covid it was delayed a couple months so he'll be you know it'll be ready ready for fall winter um but yeah the tweed the tweed mask you know, and air conditioning indoors is probably what, what he'll be wearing it at just for kicks, yeah. Okay, very good. Now look, for, uh, you know, you and I have known one another for, for many years now. I don't, I don't even know how, how long we go back, probably sort of 10 years or something. Um, but, uh, but for those who are tuning in or, or watching, uh, watching back the recording of this, um, you know, in a, in a sort of nutshell, in the elevator pitch um, or 140 characters or less uh, sort of version of it, what is the Yosel uh, Tiefenbrunn story? Um, you know, how did you uh, how did you end up where you are today? Um, because it is, yeah, it's quite a remarkable tale, right? Well, thank you. I I started off um, becoming a rabbi, which which was which I grew up studying for um, around the world in, in 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 London, New York, Israel, and France, and then I. Um, I went off to Singapore to work for the Jewish community um, kind of like to volunteer slash work and um, for whatever needed to be done. Um, but I, growing up as a young, young, uh, from the age of, I would say nine, 10, I always wanted to design clothing. So through this journey of studying to become a rabbi, the back of my mind, I was going to be, be some sort of designer making clothing. And um, I kind of pushed for it. And my stint in, in Singapore, going back, was it 2008 or so, some, sometime there, where I, um, I was a part of my, becoming a rabbi. And then I also um, I signed up to some courses and I was an intern at Harper's Bazaar in yep. Singapore. Yep. Um, and was then... then Kenny, the, Kenny as the editor there? Exactly. And I think G- Giselle... Giselle, which is no, yeah. So I was under Giselle and working with, yeah. Uh, it was a great, great team there. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then I left um, Singapore um, and trying to focus on what I, how to get to where, you know, to designing clothing. But now as a rabbi, 
um, in probably in the trying to find the right environment to do it. And, and, and you know, and I um, went knocking on all the doors of Savile Row, seeing if they took apprenticeships. And I got, a, you know, 20 no's. And, and then I learned about the Savile Row Academy. And then I signed up to a, a course in, in the Newham, Newham College or something like that. And then to cut the story short, I did six months there. I realized that's not going to go anywhere. Applied to the Savile Row Academy under Morris Sedwell. He took me on. Then he took me on as his apprentice. Um, I was there a couple of years under him. Um, I was both in the academy and as an apprentice. So I pretty much had like a double learning. You know, it's, it's one thing just to be an apprentice. And it's one thing to be a, a student in, in, a, in a school. But to have both interwined with each other, for me, was being able to visualize what I'm learning, um, which was a double kind of learning. I mean, the same thing when I was a rabbi, actually, when I was training to be a rabbi, training to be a rabbi and actually at the same time, um, almost like apprenticing. So I was able to kind of actually picture it, actually do it, um, which I think the training is a lot, is next level. And then I moved back to Singapore, well, met my wife, married in New York, moved back to Singapore, um, as a rabbi and working for Kevin, um, which was fantastic to me being able to combine the two. Yeah. Um, but then realizing that combining the two um, has, you know, both, both, um, both jobs and, uh, you know, ha have its, have its needs. And as they both grow, um, it's hard to manage both things. I mean, the, from, from, from the community perspective, I was, I was, you know, I was, we, we started off as a community of 10, 15. This is like a sub community within the main community. And, um, and we went to, to having dinners for 180, you know, 200 people, uh, which was a lot of fun and I miss it. And it was, it was great, but, but I had to organize all that. And then I had a nine to five tailoring job as well for Kevin, which was also the responsibilities were growing and his business was growing. And um, so I had to decide full-time rabbi um, and potentially giving up my tailoring um, and, uh, or, or, you know, go into tailoring. And yep. although I'm passionate, very passionate about both, I, I, I felt like I could still be a rabbi. Um, but if I was a rabbi, I couldn't do my tailoring. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? The full-time rabbi, I couldn't sit on the side and, and start basting up a suit. It was, that would be challenging. But the other way around, I would probably be, be able to, or at some point later on, um, be, be able to practice. And that's mm. what we did. We moved to New York. Um, we got a space. took us six months. So we moved to New York around four years ago, around now, four years ago. And um, it took us around six months to, to, to get the space up and running. Uh, until we found the right coat of paint, you know, the right burgundy, the right wine. That took a while. Um, picking up the different pieces of furniture. Right. And luckily, thank God, I had um, a little following um, and some, some, some people that, have, that were following me all, all along that wanted to have things made and, and knew that I was moving to New York. And, and I was able to transition. I was able to go straight into making them some pieces some garments, um, which, which was amazing. And that's yeah. how I, that's how I kicked off. Are, are you, you know, I've, I've read, I think it was in the, in the GQ story from, from last year where you were talking about, and I find this really interesting because I always find discussing challenges and, and finding a way around is can often lead to in, increased creativity and, and, you know, finding a really innovative solution. So I was reading about, you know, that. uh, because of the prohibitions of Leviticus about blended cloths or garments that are comprised of, of more than one um, cloth, that you've had to come up with some sort of innovative solutions to that. And, and has that, you know, um, are you quite unique in creating garments like that, which I guess would, would cater to, to quite a sort of pious um, element of the of the marketplace uh, which is a, a unique thing right or is, is that or is that kind of a rare request that you find it's it's definitely not a rare request i would like to say um innovative in that and that i'm the only one that does that but but unfortunately i can't say that yeah you know? um because you know there have been 
Jew, Jewish tailors for, for generations that have had that had the trouble of, you know, of, of picking of figuring that out. Mm. And, um, and I, I've, I've, I've found the right canvassing. So it's, it's, the trouble is, first of all, it's, it's wool. What I learned later on, it's, it's wool of a sheep together with linen. So it's not the wool, uh, it's not cashmere, it's not vacuna, it's not um, mohair, it's not uh, any other wool, it's not camel hair. So technically I could have linen with camel hair or linen and pure cashmere or linen and mohair and that's fine. So it's, and I didn't know this until maybe a year and a half, two years ago when mm. I was doing research on it myself. I thought it was naturally just any wool. Um, right, any hair, any wool, but it's no, it's specifically and uh, the wool of a sheep, and um, which that doesn't doesn't help so much the situation because because I would say you know in every in every uh, summer collection from uh, Kachopoli to Huna to every every mill would have um, a book of wool, silk, and linen, which yeah. which which naturally I can't you know I can't I couldn't wear, but I mean, again the that as well. I, I love a little bit of uh, wool silk linen myself. Right. But, yeah. Right. So, but, but there are, first of all, there are plenty of others. So, so I'm not, I'm not deprived in any way, but the, uh, but the, the law is about, is about wearing it. It's not about making it. Hmm. Um, which that, you know, that's, that's, I could, as a tailor, I could, I could make, I could make everything. Hmm. Um, so I have different canvases um, the kosher canvas, and the non-kosher canvas, um, which I, you know, for, for Jewish customers and, and for non-Jewish customers. Um, and obviously there's plenty, like I said, there's, there's plenty of options. There's, there's wool silk options, which are great too. There's uh, linen silk options. There's, there's plenty of op options. And yeah, so we'll be all right. Of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, oh, you, we just had a comment that that's so interesting. And, and, and it is, this is the first time I, I had, I had, been led to believe that the uh, that the law was simply about any any blended cloth, so whether that's poly cotton or, or whatever. Um, so I'm interested. I'm, I'm, yeah, that you've uh, I've learned something new today, and hopefully our viewers um, have as well. That uh, just no blending of, of wool and other stuff. Now the other interesting thing I read from you recently, um, although I, th I think I've read it from you quite some time ago, was about. Um, some of your customers having their jackets buttoning right over left rather than left over right. Um, can you tell us, uh, I, I know obviously having read it, but can you tell us about the, uh, the origins and the, and the philosophy of, um, of doing that? Sure, so, so um, the idea comes from, from first of all, it's naturally um, men wear, wear it left over right and women uh, tend to wear it right over left. That's the way. That's the way we cut it, right? That's that's. If I was making a jacket for a man, it would be left over right, and if for a woman, it would be the other way around. And um, same thing for a blouse or a shirt for a man. Uh, but traditionally, a a man, um, you know, had to kind of um, be able to kind of pull out his 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 uh, his uh, sword, his spear or whatever it was, and um, a quick release. So he had to be able to button it. Um, left over right. That's just the way it is. If you unbutton, you know, or, or even when it's buttoned, to be able to still um, pull it out with your right hand. So if it's left over right, you have a quick access to your right to your left side where where it was um, held, um, where it was in place. Um, but the Kabbalah has has a completely different approach. To this um, right represents um, kindness, chesed. Um, Versus left represents gavura, which is um, strength uh, or or judgment, that kind of thing. So um, you would always want to have the right side overpower in a way a little bit the left side, um, or not necessarily overpower, but at least have more of it. More you want more kindness over strength, but you still want the strength, but you want it. That's generally the concept. So the same, you know. So so. They go into to the extent that when it comes to buttoning up your jackets as well, that um, and it's more about it's, a, it's similar to the symbol of, of the kippa, what, what, which I wear, right? It symbolizes what does it mean? It symbolizes that God is always above you. That's the only thing. 
There's nothing more to it. So it's a reminder that God is always above you. So the same thing when you're buttoning your right over left, you're always remembering that, um, that, that the kindness kind of, you want it to be over the judgment and the strength and the kind of, in a way, leaning towards harsh. You know, you want it, the, the kindness to, to, take, to, to, to be on top. Um, and th that's that constant reminder that you want to button. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's the, the theory. It's beautiful. It's it's very. I think that that's a it's a it's a lovely thing. Um, yeah. If you I'm, if you can, you know, but you can only do it pretty much. You can only do that bespoke, you know, pretty much. Yeah. I I guess so, but but you know, I I rarely carry a sword these days. Uh, don't have the need terribly often, so you know, it's exactly. def it's definitely practical. I I yeah. did. I did read recently that that apparently the reason our shirts button left over right for a for a man um although I, I i don't know why it's why it's the other way for for ladies um is that initially it was supposed to display the fact that you didn't button up your own shirt but you had a servant to who was probably right-handed um mm. to button up your shirt your shirt for you so perhaps even taking the buttons of your shirt the other way would, would display a greater humility in the fact that you're not trying to be boastful and, and showing that you've got, um, you've got valets around your house to, uh, <laughs> can I, can I use that? Can I use that? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. definitely. No, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. Um, I think, you know, these, these things are, are silly. These rules about, uh, you know, which way, although there's, you know, there's, there are certainly some, um, tailoring traditions that, that we gotta hold. There's here. guidelines. Let's just say there's guidelines and there's traditions, and and um, and then you could kind of you know go slightly around them, or kind of you know you you gotta work with them. Yeah. Yeah. How do you describe your uh, well? You know what what is the Tiefenbrunn um, house style, if there is one, or is it you know uh, governed by uh, the tastes of the particular customer? So I, I know there's a thing about, you know, sailors having house styles, which, which you, could, you could say I have a house style, but I don't like to put myself in that box. Um, I was trained in London, um, so my tailoring is naturally British, and the roots are British. But then I had that journey through Asia and, and, and learning how other people wear it, especially in hot climates, and making jackets softer and... Um, I guess that that definitely had an influence on me. Um, so I would say, you know, I'm definitely a, a British tailor. So doing a structured jacket, but not as structured um, as as a huntsman, or uh, but then not as soft as a as a uh, an Anderson and Shepherd. So it's somewhere in between. Um, I do like a, a, a peak lapel, a nice wide peak lapel. Um, a rope shoulder, um, a little a little drape on the chest, and um, to kind of visually kind of create that you know that V and 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 that silhouette of of a little bit of a chest to be able to kind of go in sharp at the waist and to give you that shape and then flare out slightly at the, at the hip. Um, but then again, I just kind of said my house style, but but I don't like to say I have a house style because um, I'm a young tailor. Um, though I started making, started learning 10 years ago, um, but I'm always learning and, and I like to say I'm adaptive. Um, I have clients that bring me, um, different pieces to make different things that I've never made before. And they're willing to, to, to trust me to make for them things that, you know, that I've never made before. Um, yeah. and, and I'm constantly building on that. Obviously, you know, I've made many of the standard suits and the cuts and the peak lapels and notches and the, and the you know dinner suits and whatnot. But but it's uh, the interesting pieces that that occasionally that you've never you've seen them perhaps, but you've never had the 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 opportunity to make them. Um, it's hard to, for me to start making things for myself the whole time. Um, although I just posted to myself in a fitting, but it really, but that's a, I, I I don't get myself in a fitting too often. Um, COVID kind of helped that a little bit. I kind of worked on some stuff for myself. Um, but, uh, it's the famous saying, it, it's, it's a Hebrew saying. It might, if I'm, don't quote me on this, I might be wrong. It might not be a Hebrew saying, 
But in Hebrew, it goes like this. Um, what is it? Um, um, I just slipped my mind. Um, okay, I'll say it in English because the wording just slipped my mind. It's no. that the tailor, the tailor goes barefoot naturally, right? The tailor goes barefoot because, the, the, sorry, the shoemaker goes barefoot. Um, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, the shoe, because you know he's, he he can't afford to, or can't afford or he has no time to make yeah. himself um, his own shoes. The same thing with the tailor in a way. And the time that it takes you to make a, a fully bespoke suit, um, 80 plus hours of work, um, it's hard, especially when we're really busy, thank God, it's hard to kind of put those hours in for yourself. Um, yeah. Or even to get the team, even to get my team to work on that when we have a million other things to do. Um, but occasionally uh, we slip one in and, uh, and we get one. I just remember the, the, the quote in Hebrew, it's Hassan la holech yachaf, that the shoemaker goes barefoot. That's that's what it is. Yeah, that's beautiful. We're having a, a very poetic uh, interview today. <laughs> Great, and and um, I love the fact that you know we've got um, a number of uh, of quite seasoned and amazing uh, tailors listening in today. Um, not least my old friend uh, Tim Everest, who uh, made one of one of my absolute favourite suits of all time um and just with with with, with that in mind with uh, some of these uh, veterans like like tim and darren beeman who are listening in um what would you say is some of the greatest advice and while we're talking um quotes uh if, if you can encapsulate in a quote what is some of the greatest advice that you've you've received with um with the tailors that you've uh, you've worked with or for over your uh, over the course of your career um that's interesting um i think the greatest advice i i i, I got was um while apprenticing well i would say the greatest advice but also the greatest guidance i got um was while apprenticing um besides obviously apprenticing on the more on the andrew ramroop mm -hmm. um but some of the old tailors, the older tailors in their 80s uh, were there in the back room and they would constantly give me advice and, and, and teach me different techniques that I wouldn't, um, that I wouldn't have picked up um, on my own or, or even watching over another tailor. Um, different, different ways of cutting and also just the, the way, different ways of putting in a sleeve um, and uh, you know, putting in a sleeve in, in the armhole is, is probably one of the hardest things of tailoring. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, um, what was it one? It was, I was working on actually my wedding coat and, uh, you know, I was working on my wedding coat. It was actually one of my final pieces that I made before I hopped off to, to New York uh -huh. and left. Um, so it was, it was, it was one evening and, and, uh, and I was struggling with the with the with the putting in the sleeve, and it was that the old tailor, and he was working already after hours, and he he stopped. He spent like another three hours with me, um, till late till late at night. And this must have been around eight eight thirty that he was supposed to leave, and he stayed with me till around eleven thirty twelve. Um, mm -hmm. And he's in his eighties, you know, whatever it was, eighty six back then, and this is what eight years ago or something like that. Um, and, um, that was very inspiring to me. He was, he was willing to, to spend the extra time and teach this young, young man, um, you know, the, 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 the trade, which, which I think, you know, it, it, some tailors try to, you know, kind of keep the secrets and, and, and don't feel so, you know, don't feel the need or, or feel comfortable giving it over. But I was, you know, I was lucky to be around people that 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 felt, you know, uh, felt comfortable and 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 happy to share their their techniques and um, their experiences. Um, and I, and that's what I and I'm and, and I think I've learned that for myself because I'm doing that now. I have young guys come from FIT um, and intern with me, and then kind of apprentice, and then eventually I, I, I hire them and. Um, I feel like the need and, and to give back and to, 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 to train them and obviously also to grow a team, but, but to train them from scratch and to give them those techniques that I was 
that I was taught in the, in the back rooms um, and not kind of keep them to myself and, 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 and not share them. I think, I think that was, uh, um, for me, that was the strongest lesson going forward, um, uh, which I took with me here. Yeah, that, that well, I absolutely agree with you. You know, there's, there's nothing um, more fulfilling than passing on the skills that you've, uh, that you've yourself developed or, or gleaned during the course of, uh, of your career. I've, I've definitely, you know, found um, instances where I've had the opportunity to, to kind of mentor or, uh, or just help guide uh, people who've been working under me. Uh, it's immensely fulfilling. It's, uh, you know, I can't imagine anyone trying to closely guard, be like Gollum and guard, <laughs> their, keep them their prey. Secrets, the secrets, yeah, yeah. That's crazy, absolutely. Yeah. Um, going, going back to the, to the masks, um, you know, how, how are you communicating the fact that what you're doing, you know, that there have been a lot of, whether it's uh, um, industrial clothing manufacturers or, you know, tailoring houses, lots of shirt makers and things have, have switched into helping out with, uh, with making scrubs for, for hospitals and with making um, other sorts of PPE or, you know, going into making, I guess a little bit more, more simple masks, um, you know, the kind of standard thing that's the sort of four pleats and that kind of conforms to your face, but it's sort of a, a one size fits all. How are you communicating the facts um, that, yes, yours might be $45, $50 or whatever, but, um, but you know, they're, uh, they're on another level um, to those kind of standard, uh, standard ones that are, well, I mean, I guess the, the articles, the articles helped out. They did mention, they did mention that um, you, your glasses don't fog up as much, you know, um, in them, um, which for glasses wearers, that was, um, that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, you, I would say that many people feel comfortable now wearing, a, 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 wearing a mask now that their glasses don't fog up. So oh. I feel like I, I've, I've helped, I've helped those people out in, in terms of now they'll, they'll feel comfortable wearing a mask. They'll go out and they'll, they'll feel protected and, uh, and protect, you know, and, and um, not spread the virus if they had it to other people. Um, but uh, I, I think through the, through the article and then through social media, I think just, just different posts and, and things like that. Yeah. I think it's, I've been, I've been reading that. Um, I think there, there was a, just this weekend, uh, uh, it was a Washington Post, uh, I think, or um, something of that ilk story about the fact that, that men are not wearing masks because they don't think it's macho or, you know, they, they think it's uh, emasculating, which I just find, I find incredible. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. so I... <laughs> it's, it's, it's unfortunate. I think that, that masks have become a little political and it's like, you know, yeah. um, it is what it is. I feel like, you know, you wear a mask. Um, it's, it's what people have got to do. It's a new norm. Um, and, um, you know, you could wear it, you could not wear it, but there are plenty of people that have had the virus, uh, including myself that have had the antibodies and don't feel the need to wear it anymore. So you will go to places, areas in, in, in Brooklyn and you are, you'll find like thousands of people not wearing masks. But then again, these are communities that literally everybody's had it. They've had hard immunity. They, they, you know, so they don't feel necessarily the need to wear it, to, to wear it anymore. But, um, you know, each to their own. Um, I'm making them. I'm wearing them. And I definitely wear them at work. And my glasses aren't fogging up. So um, that's, that's pretty much that's, that's where we are. Very good. Well, um... Tim, Tim Everest was just asking the question. He was saying, what's the future beyond masks? And, and it was a question that I did want to ask you um, anyway. And I've been kind of discussing, I think this is my 32nd or, or something of these interviews that I've been doing over this, um, over this period. And with a lot of the you know, style uh, slash menswear conversations that I've been having, um, we've been kind of pondering whether you know, we're going to emerge from this period of, you know, I personally, I've, I've been basically, have barely left my house apart from to go to the grocery store 
for the last, it's like 80 days. It's, it's a wow. long time. Wow. Uh, yeah, we're, we've just been sort of conservatively allowed to sort of ease our way out here in Singapore and, and once again, dine at restaurants and cafes and stuff. Um, but, how, you know, with that period of being cooped up and, and the numbers I'm seeing are saying that, you know, consumption of, of clothing and lots of other lots of other, you know, goods that are all about how you present yourself to the outside world have been, you know, um, dramatically dropping. Do you think we're going to kind of come out of, of this period of where a lot of people have been slouching around at home in their, uh, in their tracksuit bottoms and uh, their fleecy lines, um, T-shirts and, and whatnot, to come out and, you know, put on the Ritz? Or are people just going to be even more stuck in, in casual wear than, uh, you know, than the trend has already been going with athleisure and, and all this sort of thing? Which, which way do you think the pendulum's going to swing? Well, naturally now, people are not um, zoned in on buying suits. Um, well, at least the majority of people. You, you, you're going to have, and thank God I have customers that love clothing, love to suit up, mm -hmm. um, and are still getting out. And, you know, um, so you're going to have those customers. But generally speaking, I mean, the weddings have all been pushed up. Um, I had wedding clients that, that were supposed to be having weddings this month, next month, in August, and et cetera, the whole summer. So that they've pushed it off a full year because I guess they don't want to risk it for pushing it off to January or, or they wanted a summer wedding. Um, so that's, that's, that's difficult. But, but also in general, I think um, having people work from home, the longer we have people work from home, the less people would definitely find the need to go and buy a suit. And, 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 mm -hmm. um, but then from the other side, um, what we do is an experience. So mm -hmm. we have, right? Bespoke is definitely an experience. People want to know where it's made, how it's made, have a relationship with the tailor, um, that whole thing. It, it's, it's, it's not just about the cut, the fit, the, the, the fabric, the color, the, the, it's about, you know, the taste of the tailor. It's about that relationship. It's about the experience. So I think people are still going to be looking for that experience. Um, it might, so we might go, it might be interesting because you're ready to wear shops might, might um, kind of, you know, people that are walking into to Kiton or, or to, or even on, on a low end, um, might not be buying as much anymore, but, but hopefully, and I'm, I'm being optimistic, maybe, maybe too much, but hopefully, hopefully the experiences of bespoke, um, because we were kind of going, going that way. I mean, people want more and more experiences, whether it's hotels, whether it's whiskey, whether it's cigars, uh, people want to know food. People want to know where it's from, how it's made, you know, what ingredients is in it. Um, and uh, I think that will continue going, rising. Mm. That's my feeling. And yeah. um, I am being optimistic, but I hope it. I hope that's that's the case, and and that and that for the for bespoke tailors and for tailors, um, we'll continue making, uh, uh, continue, you know, practicing our craft and and making. Uh, um, garments. Well, something I, I often try to stress to people who are less familiar than I have the good fortune to be with, with the, the sort of tailoring experience is that, you know, it's uh, the common perception is that it's, you have to go in there and have a very traditional, you know, pinstripe three piece banker kind of suit or a tuxedo or, or, you know, something of that nature made. Um, Whereas you know, with with bespoke, you you're imagine you're limited only by your imagination, really, aren't you? And and the willingness of the of the tailor to go on a journey with you. So you know, in right. the same, I hate to keep bring it back to Tim here, but uh, but you know, he made me a bespoke safari suit based on the like safari suits that Roger Moore wore in um, in, in in his sort of 1970s James Bond films. Or you can go in and say, I'd like a pair of you know uh, crazy check trousers, and I'm going to wear golfing. Or I would like a, you know, a bespoke Hawaiian shirt or, you know, whatever it may be, you know, have to be conservative stuff. Exactly. So there, there's plenty to do. And that's why you're going to a tailor because, you, you know, you have a vision and together with the tailor, you're able to execute it 
and um, create something that speaks to you. It might not be a suit, it might be a sports jacket or, or any kind of garment that, will, that you'll feel comfortable in. Like it could be a cigar shirt, it could be, it could be yeah. anything. So again, we, we, you might not be wearing as many suits anymore, perhaps, um, for some. Um, like I said, there are some that will be wearing suits um, for the rest of their lives and supporting tailors around the world. But for, for those that, that won't be wearing suits, that want to be, still feel comfortable, but want to, want to feel like they're wearing something unique, something that speaks to them and to them only. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll, I think they'll keep, they'll keep coming and, and creating things. Um, yeah. Creativity is, is going to continue. This, that's not coming to us, you know. So whether it's, in, whether it's in the tailor's mind or in the client's mind and then just having to match it up, that's going to continue. Um, and then, and then people are still making money and will be still making money. So th there's always going to be that, I hope, um, that a good combination. Yeah. Well, so some people have, have sort of suggested that, that, um, in the same way that after the Spanish flu, uh, we came out and, and had the roaring twenties, which was all very, uh, jazz age decadence and sort of Gatsby-esque, um, you know, beautiful shirts and and pink suits and whatnot that Jay Gatsby wore. That you know, maybe we'll have a uh, a similar sort of uh, uh, roaring twenty twenties where people will um, put on the Ritz and uh, dress up to the nines. So you never know; it could swing. Well, you never know. Yeah. Well, that's what I think. That's what in January first. I think that's what we were hoping for. Um, and then uh, you know, things <laughs> like if a man plans and God laughs. Have you heard of that one? Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, it is what it is. We'll take it, but we'll we'll get back stronger than ever and uh, continue creating things and hope for, hope for the best. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, if any, if anyone who's listening in has got any uh, any questions that you'd like to throw at us, please uh, please do. But uh, but yeah, you know, otherwise it, it, it's been, it's been great chatting with you and uh, and you know mm. I I look forward to paying you a visit in in New York when we can um, get back on uh, on planes, trains, and automobiles, and uh, come back. I, th I think the great advantage of this lockdown period is that, uh, well, for, for people in your business, is that many of us have been sitting around at home and uh, consuming a little bit too much food and drink. So uh, maybe we, uh, I, I, I certainly need either my existing garments let out a little bit or some uh, Awesome new ones. Um, someone there was just asking whether you're going to be doing uh, trunk shows uh, anywhere else in the world. Yeah, we will be. We'll, we'll start with first other states in, in America. Um, hopefully within the year um, or possibly in 21, we'll, we'll get to um, Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco, uh, DC, Boston. Um, I have gone to Boston a few times uh, for a few clients. Um, but I hope to kind of s spread out a little bit and travel a bit more. But again, once um, once we feel comfortable getting on a plane, which which I I'm I'm ready to get back on a plane. Um, sure. I guess yeah. I, I speak for myself having the virus or having had the virus already. Um, um, so I I feel more confident um, about going back on a plane. But I understand many that you know that wouldn't as of yet. But I hope we can we could get back to that time and travel again and visit places and see people, see friends, and I think yeah. Uh, yeah, and I hope that you could come visit our atelier and 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 see what we do and have a good yeah. few whiskeys. I, I haven't been to New York in in many years, obviously not not at all since uh, since you moved there, and I've got so many uh, so many friends there. And as you say, nothing substitutes for the uh, uh, sitting face to face, and even if you're six feet safely apart. Um, drinking those whiskeys and not touching them together cheers but uh, or whatever the safe measures are but uh, what was the, the other question that someone asked was how do you and I remain so well groomed I, I don't know I guess so how have you how have you kept your tonsorial um, act in gear over the last few months um, well I've definitely gained I've definitely gained a little bit <laughs> I mean you know I, I had a fitting for myself but I, I realized that I had to let out I had to let out my pattern a little bit, um, but oh, no. um, not the, the the beard. No, the obviously. Head, um, I, I just know. I just had a haircut for the first time today, 
Um, I was supposed to have had it on on Thursday, um, but they were so busy. Um, they were so busy the whole last week because they just opened a week ago here in New York. Um, okay. So I finally had finally had a haircut um, today, and we had it just. I was the only one in the shop, um, and it was it was like by appointment only. No one could wait inside. You had to wait outside. Um, but finally, I was able to have a haircut, which was refreshing. Yeah, I've uh, I, I snuck out for one a little while ago, and it was it was a interesting experience. You had to wear the mask all the way through. So when they were sort of doing around the that part, kind of having to hold it over over the face, it was a yeah, interesting. It was interesting. But, you know, uh, and I haven't gone back to have have the beard done professionally. I'm uh, struggling on trying to do that. DIY, though I find these things are much better handled by the professionals. So, um, you've got, yeah, you've got to, yeah, your beard is looking sharp. Yeah. That's, that's, thank you, sir. thank you. That's praise from Caesar there. So, uh, <laughs> thank you again. But um, look, I'll, I'll let you get back to your life because it's getting uh, it's getting late at night, and let you get back uh, home to your your wife and lovely kids. And uh, a great pleasure speaking with you, mate. And look, yeah, as yeah. I, said, I, I can't wait to to see you in person again. And so glad you're well and uh, and doing so well. Every time I see you in the press, I'm like, holy cow, that's Yosel. You're like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely stoked to see you doing um, so, so well. It's uh, it's a real delight. Well, same here. I didn't hear much about your life, so I guess we'll save that for, for when you come over and we'll have a few drinks together. And yeah. uh, looking forward to it, please, God. Otherwise, I'll have to come over to Singapore. You're always welcome. You're always welcome. But at the moment, you'd have to stay in a hotel for two weeks when you arrive here um, on your own, which doesn't sound like much fun, particularly no. if you've got the wife and kids. I don't imagine that all being in, the, in a hotel room together would be, uh, would be great. But thank you so much to everyone who, who joined us today. And uh, thanks for all of the lovely comments and, uh, and questions. Really, really uh, kind of you. Glad you all enjoyed this, uh, this conversation and, and join me again tomorrow for uh, another installment of Banter with Barker here on Instagram. Thanks again, Yosel. Take care. Bye. All the best. You too. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.